Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, this webinar will be on greenwashing, specifically how to spot greenwashing. So uh, if you joined our webinars for the past couple months, then um, you, you probably already know me by now, but I'll go ahead and introduce myself and CSWD. So um, I'm Kat Moody. I am the Community Outreach Coordinator at Chin In Solid Waste District. And um, we've been doing a winter webinar series this winter. Each uh, month, the first Wednesday of each month, we've been diving into a different topic. So tonight's topic is how to spot greenwashing. And before we officially dive in, uh, I'll just give an overview of what you can expect from tonight's presentation. So firstly, I'll give a little intro to CSWD, who we are and what we do, and then I'll define greenwashing. It might be a new term for some of you, um, and some of you might be well aware of what, what this means, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about what it means. I'll give a short history of greenwashing, how that term came to be, and then why it matters and why you should care about greenwashing. And then the bulk of the presentation will be how to spot greenwashing and different examples of greenwashing. Um, and then finally, at the end, going over how to read a product label and then finally questions. So um, the, the presentation should be around half hour with about, you know, 10, 15 minutes uh sort of spell there at the end for questions great so dswd is a municipality that serves um all of chittenden county um schools businesses residents we have uh, uh our organics recycling facility home of green mountain compost where uh, Chittenden County businesses and homes send their compost. And then we also have several drop-off centers around the, the county. Um, we have an environmental depot that manages hazardous waste. And finally, our materials recycling facility, which is where about half of Vermont's recycling goes to be sorted, bailed, and then sold and shipped off to, to be recycled into new products. And then we also have our outreach department, which I'm a part of, um, and we host these webinars, presentations, workshops, um, and different educational opportunities for, for the community and schools and businesses as well. All right, so jumping in here for our, our greenwashing presentation, First off, let's define greenwashing. So greenwashing is defined as the act of marketing a company, product, or service to appear more environmentally friendly than it actually is. So this is done in several ways um, using different tactics that we'll go over in the presentation, um, but some tactics that you, you might already be aware of are, you know, green, imagery, colors, um, and sustainability-related buzzwords that you see in the image here, like natural, eco, earth-friendly, um, but basically just making a product or a company seem more environmentally friendly. And now we'll dive into a little bit of history on greenwashing. Um, I'm not going to touch on every single thing that you see here on the timeline, um, but I just wanted to touch on some of the key events on the timeline. And the first being uh, that in, in 1986, in the environmentalist um, who coined this term greenwashing, his name was Jay Westerveld. And he was actually on a trip doing some research in Fiji, and he noticed that at a hotel, they had a sign asking guests to 
uh, reuse their towels. And, and you probably, if you've been to a hotel or, or motel recently, you might have seen similar signs, but this was sort of one of the first hotels that started doing this. And the sign that he saw read, oceans and reefs are important, are, are an important resource. So reusing your towel helps to reduce the ecological damage that they may face. So while the hotel requested that guests reuse their towels to help the environment and to help specifically the oceans and reefs, um, that same hotel was actually in the middle of expanding their hotel chain to build more bungalows along the beach. So clearly this hotel chain um, and their Save the Towel campaign contradicted the environmentally harmful construction that they were doing at the time. And the environmentalist, Jay Westerveld, saw that the hotel industry's Save the Towel campaign was sort of falsely promoting the reuse of towels as being something very environmentally friendly that they were, were doing to protect the ocean, um, when in fact, this campaign was just designed to, to save them money. Um, and that's when he termed the term uh, or coined the term greenwashing, uh, just to explain this phenomenon that he witnessed. And then by the early 1990s, the term greenwashing was added to the um, English dictionary. And we were also starting to see a, a trend of consumers um, caring more about companies' sustainability and the sustain sustainability of products that they were buying. Uh, and then in 2005, uh, the oil company BP actually coined the phrase carbon footprint. And this was in a campaign to shift the focus on to the individual away from what was going on with their own harmful, with BP's own harmful environmental impact. So they actually created this uh, carbon footprint campaign and they asked individuals to calculate their own impact on the, on the world using, using their website. Um, and then once each individual would uh, calculate their carbon footprint, they would then, um, BP would provide ways for them to lower this, just little tips like uh, try biking to work instead of driving. Um, and this campaign was, you know, as I said, all aimed at shifting the attention away from BP's pollution and oil spills, specifically one that happened that same year um, that got them a lot of bad press but their carbon footprint campaign helped them to put the focus onto the individual. And although it's true that individual action is really important, um, it's something that we care a lot about, um, I care a lot about, and also care a lot about as, um, you know, an employee of an organization trying to help people reduce and reuse, um, that individual action jargon can also be utilized by companies to just shift the focus away from their own harmful impacts. Um, and then finally, we see on the last uh, point of this timeline that from 2009 to 2010, products labeled green increased by 73%. So that just gives you an idea of the trend that we were seeing um, with uh, sustainability and greenwashing and companies' role within each of those spaces. So uh, now that we know what greenwashing is, a little history, uh, here's a little graphic that shows actually why companies greenwash. And you can see in the graphic that about 64% of Americans are willing to pay more for sustainable products. 77% of Americans stated they're concerned with the environmental impact of their products. And then finally, 73 
percent of Americans use a product's environmental friendliness as a factor in their purchasing decisions. So all of this to say there is a rising demand for products that are more sustainable. And companies, you know, see this data, they see the trend and they realize that they can make more money since the data shows that consumers are willing to pay more for sustain for sustainable products. Um, and companies can also improve their brand's reputation if they're viewed as a more environmentally conscious company. Um, and overall, companies participate in, in greenwashing in order just to capitalize on the growing trend of consumers valuing sustainability. So um, many companies find that it costs less to make something look more sustainable than it costs to actually make that product more sustainable. So that's where greenwashing comes in. Um, and why you should care. So I think that um, as individuals, as consumers, we want to do what's best. We want to buy you know, things that are good for ourselves, for the environment. And unfortunately, greenwashing um, can mislead customers a bit. So um, it, you know, it's important to be able to recognize greenwashing because you can avoid being misled um, and, and maybe avoid overpaying for products that are being greenwashed um, and then also avoid getting a product that looks like it's sustainable, um, but it's not. And instead getting a product that has, you know, backing and uh, authenticity to it. Um, and then another reason why it matters is it makes it difficult to identify truly authentically um, environmentally friendly brands and then differentiate those from the ones posing as environmentally friendly brands. Um, and then lastly, it harms brand reputation. So those are just some, some key points on why this topic is important. And ways to spot this greenwashing, we will go into each of these. Um, there are 10 listed here. And um, as we go through the presentation, I'll give an example with each of these tactics to look out for. So the first one here that you see is fluffy language. So language with no clear meaning, regulations, or link to true sustainable practices. So I included a number of examples and the first one here you can see is Nature Valley. Um, right under their brand name, Nature Valley, you can see 100% natural. And then the next picture, Nature's Promise. It's a little hard to see, but right under the words laundry detergent are the words free and clear. And then again, the last image has the words all natural. So this language of free and clear, 100% natural, all natural. Those are all examples of this fluffy language tactic that's used in the greenwashing. And even the brand's names themselves are um, utilizing this, uh, this tactic of fluffy language by creating a bit of a subconscious asso association to nature and sustainability. So nature's valley, nature's promise, Harvest Bay, um, all create um, that association with sustainability without really having a regulated um, approach to sustainability. So someone could put natural, all natural, free and clear, any of these words on packaging, and it doesn't have to be regulated or certified. Um, so that's just something to look out for when you are shopping. All right, let's see. And our next slide here 
we have vague statements. So a company might make a claim about its eco-friendliness without sharing certifications or evidence to back up those claims. So an example of this is in is seen in this Coca-Cola ad, um, sweetness from natural sources. So that's a sort of a pretty vague statement. Um, and again, like mentioned in the other slide, there aren't any certifications to back up that statement. Um, and and you can also, it's easy to, to buy into that uh, sweetness from a natural source to buy into that statement, to buy into the greenwashing effect of that. Um, but to to have the sort of critical thinking um, is important to approach these ads of, okay, what does that actually mean? And is that actually telling me something about what they're doing as a sustainable brand? Um, in this case, it's, it's not. Our third example here is actually one that uh, is probably one of the most popular ones for marketers to use. It's um, the use of misleading imagery. So marketers will use earthy colors and imagery to intentionally influence people's feelings, thoughts, and actions in order to make the product appear more sustainable. So in, if you've ever taken a marketing course, uh, it's pretty interesting. There is um, There are a lot of studies showing the psychology behind colors whether that's a color of a product, a color of a brand. Um, so McDonald's, for example, will use uh, red and yellow. Those colors are studied, have been studied to show an association with hunger. Um, green has been a color that's been studied in depth and that's showing, uh, it, it shows that people have an association with between green and uh, tranquility, green and nature, and green and sustainable. So um, when you see this use of, in the Dasani ad, green leaves, and in the BP image here, sort of a flowery green uh, branding, those are all examples of using that psychology of color to maybe influence your feelings and thoughts towards that product and towards that brand. So uh, I know that I'm guilty actually of driving down the road. And um, if I see a, a BP gas station and another gas station, I'm, I've actually been more likely to stop at the BP gas station because I am sort of subconsciously drawn to something that looks greener, looks more sustainable, but um, it's sort of just a psychological tactic that marketers are using to evoke that sense of, of earthiness. Another tactic is the outlier. So this is when a single product um, that may be more sustainable is made um, but it's made by an, an uns by an unsustainable company. So an example here shown below is um, an ad by the fast fash fast fashion company Shein. So they recently actually uh, came out with a sustainable clothing line, um, quote unquote sustainable. And this clothing line is made out of recycled materials. So um, this is you know, a great step towards sustainability, making a product or a product line all out of sustainable or all out of recyclable, sorry, recycled material. But um, this is just an example of the outlier because this is just one seemingly sustainable clothing line um, out of all of the products that they make and they still overall run a pretty unsustainable practice of churning out 500 to 2,000 clothing items per day, each very cheaply made and um, very cheaply priced, which promotes this overconsumption of 
clothing items and the fast fashion cycle. So they they made this clothing line, obviously in an attempt to to redeem their uh, reputation a bit. They they have been known a well known notorious fast fashion company. Um, this line has helped them um, sort of peak above water in terms of looking a little bit more sustainable. Um, but in reality, that's the outlier to the rest of their products. And these products are still produced by it's sort of an unethical working conditions um, and by underpaid workers and overworked as well. The average worker for this company works 72 hours a week. So despite this looking like a good thing, um, if you dig a little deeper, it's still a problematic company. So selective disclosure is our next one. Um, and we'll watch an ad here and then talk about talk about the ad afterwards. But selective disclosure is when a company highlights a positive environmental fact about a product or something that they're doing as a company while intentionally avoiding the negative. So um, this is an ad by a chemical company, DuPont, um, and it's an announcement ad announcing it's double, DuPont's double hold oil tankers that are meant to protect the environment. So we'll watch this. I'll make sure my sound is on. Recently, DuPont announced that its energy unit Conoco would pioneer the use of new double hold oil tankers in order to safeguard the environment. The response has been overwhelmingly positive. Better things for better living. All right. So that was just a quick ad to show this selective disclosure example. Um, the ad, as you can see, um, announced this, this double hold oil tanker to quote unquote safeguard the environment. And then in this ad, you could see marine animals jumping and prancing to Ode to Joy. And um, this ad was released in 1991. So it's a pretty old ad from probably the quality of the video that you can you could have seen there. But um, in that same year that it released this ad, um, highlighting this positive environmental thing that they were doing, um, that same year, they actually they being DuPont, um, they ranked as the largest corporate polluter in the U.S. So again, a little bit of selective disclosure here, showing the public the things that they're proud of, and of course, hiding the fact that they were the largest corporate polluter in the U.S. that year. And then next, we have symbolic actions. So um, another ad that we'll look at here um, except this one is a Chevron ad, and um, this shows the Chevron. The Chevron ad shows um, a campaign that they released in the mid 1980s called "People Do." So essentially, they were attempting to convince people of their environmental focus. They um, created a butterfly sanctuary as a part of this campaign and released a series of television ads. And we'll watch one of them here. And again, it's it's a short one, so it's only about 30 seconds. In a den high in Montana's Blackfeet country, a grizzly settles for a long winter's nap. Unaware that down below, people with motors and machinery will explore for oil through deep winter. But before she wakes, the people will be gone. The explored land will be replanted so it will soon look as if no one had ever been there. Do people sometimes work through the winter so nature can have spring all to herself? People do. All right. So this ad, 
described how the people who drill for oil through the winters while bears are hibernating, um, but once spring swings around, the people drilling will be gone and the impact on the environment will be like they were never there. So, of course, exaggerating uh, and falsely claiming that they're doing something and they're timing their oil drilling with um, with wildlife in mind, with nature in mind, um, and with little to no impact. Um, so very clear greenwashing there. Um, and then also using language like explore for oil instead of drill to try to create some gentler imagery for, for folks watching. Um, so uh, this was just one of the, the ads in their people do campaign, but basically, you know, they, they ran this campaign to look good um, look like they were having a positive effect on the environment, building these butterfly sanctuaries, releasing ads with um, a lot of nature imagery. Um, but while it, the ad campaign was running, um, Chevron was also violating the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and um, had some major oil spilling into wildlife refugees. Um, so sort of running these ads and the campaign to shift focus away from their harmful impact. So we have a few more tactics that we'll go over. Um, this one is hidden trade-offs. So brands might advertise a new change as green while ignoring its negative effects. And one of this, one of these examples here um, is Starbucks introducing a straw-free lid to avoid wasting plastic straws. Um, so this was a, a change marketed as green, um, but what wasn't, what was sort of in more of the fine print was that the new lids actually use more plastic than the old straw and lid combined. Um, and this is where I think greenwashing gets a little bit nuanced when, when we have these types of conversations because um, it's, you know, something green that they were trying to do was um, eliminate the plastic straw. And they did that by using these new caps. But the trade-off, again, being that the new caps have more plastic. Um, and, you know, the other trade-off, the, the new caps can be recycled as opposed to the straw that couldn't be. So, you know, it just goes to show that greenwashing isn't all bad. It's a little bit complicated sometimes. It's not a very clear, like, oh, that was a bad decision or that was the right move. Um, you know, it's a little more clear with the examples of the oil companies or chemical companies. But with this, um, there's a little bit more um, debate that could be had. So, yes, they're using more plastic now with the new lids, but the new lids can be recycled. Um, so a little bit of a, a trade-off there. Another interesting one is irrelevance. Uh, this one is when there's a claim that is technically true, but irrelevant to its environmental impact. So this example here shows an aerosol can um, that's advertising that it's CFC three. Um, which is true, but CFCs have been illegal in the U.S. since 1978. So that shows that, you know, they can market that as being very environmentally friendly, but it's actually illegal. So it if they didn't have that advertisement, then they would lose out on not looking good. That's pretty much the only reason they're advertising it is just to to present as more environmentally friendly, but really um, it wouldn't have CFCs in it anyways because of regulations in the US. Overinflated phrases. So phrases that are technically true, but give a consumer a skewed perception of the products that they're buying. So um, here we see a 
2021 Apple ad that states uh, states that it's using 50% more recycled material in their products. So that sounds like a, a big number, 50%. But when you break it down, um, that actually was just an increase from the 12% recycled material that they were using to 18%. So 50% sounds a lot better than um, looking at the 12% recycled material to 18%. So this improvement on Apple's part is a great thing. It's not to say that this is bad. It's just to be aware that um, overinflated phrases might skew someone's perception towards a product or, or business. But Apple does have some great goals and they're doing really good things with increasing their um, overall sustainability there. Um, they have goals in 2025 to eliminate plastic from packaging to uh, use 100% recycled cobalt in all Apple designed batteries um, and just use generally more recycled material. So um, not a bad thing here that they're greenwashing because they're working towards doing better things, um, but just an awareness around uh, the scale at which they're claiming to um, have improved their recycled material usage. And then lastly, we have lesser of two evils. So when companies promote one beneficial aspect of an otherwise damaging product, and this line of Ziploc Evolve bags is a good example of that. So um, this line of, of Ziplocs are, um, they're advertising that they use 25% less plastic, which is a great alternative to the original Ziploc bags. Um, but, you know, an even better alternative would be using cloth bags or, you know, reusable silicone bags. Um, so, again, this just shows that greenwashing is on a spectrum. It's a good example of a product that might be somewhere in the middle of that spectrum. So not the most harmful example of greenwashing, um, like an oil company, but, you know, still not completely off the spectrum because it's... Um, it's still a plastic bag. Okay, so now um, we're reaching sort of the end of the presentation here. I wanted to um, show an example of, you know, when you're shopping for products, um, what you might look for in terms of trustworthy labels. So it's important to pay attention to labels and um, language used and imagery used as we, you know, have been going over in this presentation. Um, and the labels here to the left that you can see are examples of misleading labels. So labels that aren't regulated or certified or clearly defined. And actually all these labels here, I just um, copy and pasted from a sticker company that sell sells, you know, these stickers that brands and companies can buy to put on their products. Um, so none of it is regulated, but they all look and sound and make a product sound more environmentally friendly. So farm fresh, that doesn't have any regulations, biodegradable, all natural, eco-friendly, all those can be utilized without um, being regulated or certified versus the labels on the right here are all trustworthy labels that you might see. Um, and they do have um, regulations and go through a third party um, certification process. Um, and in the follow up email, I'll actually send out some uh, a resource where you can sort of see a directory of these certifications if you're ever interested in knowing like hmm, what actually does it mean to be e core certified like what does the company have to do um to achieve that certification or fair trade certification um but yeah some of these are are certifications to look out for um if you're trying to opt for a more sustain sustainable product 
And then I did want to uh, include this slide in here um, because I think it's important to remember not to be skeptical of everything. So I know the last, the, the last, you know, dozen slides were brands to be cautious of, tactics to, to look out for, but not everything is, um, greenwashing you. So, um, I just put in some examples of, of brands that are actually truly sustainable. So Patagonia being one of them, Pelicase, uh, and Burt's Bees, even uh, in the center of the screen here, you can see a salad leaf container. Um, it's, it's sold by Bright Farm. And a lot of these companies and brands and products use tactics that look similar to greenwashing, but aren't. So the Bright Farms um, example, you know, they have language that says cleaner and greener. Uh, they have a sun and sort of that green imagery, um, but it's not greenwashing. This is a truly sustainable brand. They're um, a semi-local farm. They, I believe, are carbon neutral. Um, so they're doing great things. So even though it looks like they're utilizing tactics that are greenwashing. Um, you don't have to keep your your guard up around everything because um, this is a, a sustainable brand. Um, and then Preserve on the far right there, that's a toothbrush that's made out of um, yogurt cups, so completely out of recycled material. Um, so just being aware that, yes, there are products out there that are um, being are a little tricky and a, you know, a little sneaky with their greenwashing tactics, but not everything is. So it just comes down to, um, what I'll say here is comes down to just being aware as a consumer, doing your research when it comes to um, products and brands, um, thinking critically, but, you know, not too critically that you drive yourself crazy or go down a scary greenwashing uh, skeptic, uh, rabbit hole and supporting brands that are authentically doing work towards environmental protection and sustainability. And then lastly, remembering that greenwashing is on a spectrum. So if you are used to buying Ziploc bags, going for the Ziploc bag that's, that's used or that's greenwashing and a greenwashing example that I that I showed you all was that Ziploc Evolve line. So if you're used to buying the regular Ziploc bags and you switch to the greenwashed example that I show you of the Ziploc Evolve bags, like that's fine because it's, you know, better than the alternative. So whatever you can do to, to sort of go one step further towards sustainability is great. Even if that's still being on the greenwashing spectrum and just working your way um, farther away from the most harmful greenwashing examples and towards the not so harmful examples, sometimes greenwashing can be a little bit of a stepping stone to a more sustainable lifestyle. So if you utilize um, greenwashing in that way, um, I think there's an argument that can be made for why greenwashing can act sort of as a catalyst for, for consumers to be overall more sustainable and um, slowly ease into a more sustainable lifestyle. So just a little food for thought there. Um, and then I have some resources here that I'll send out in a follow-up email, but there are a lot of really cool apps and websites that allow you to dive a little further into brands and products. So you don't have to do your own research from ground zero. Uh, Good On You is a website that rates clothing brands on sustainability. Um, they don't have every single clothing brand out there, but if you were to search um, L.L. Bean, you could see their ranking on um, environmental sustainability and how the site Good On You ranks each clothing brand. Um, and then you could also search Shein, the brand that I mentioned in one of the greenwashing examples, and it would show you probably, okay, that's not, that ranks pretty low on our sustainability um, ranking. 
Think Dirty is another one, uh, sort of funny, quirky name, but it's an app to search for sustainable beauty products and cleaning products. Um, and then there's an eco label index. So I mentioned that, but it's searching for product labels like B Core and certified organic and um, helps you understand what those labels mean and just helps you educate you um, to be a more conscious consumer. So now uh, we will open it up to questions here. Hi, Kat, it's Beth, and we've got several questions in here. Um, Susan wants to know how much recyclable plastic is actually being recycled, and if there's any pressure for government regulation to increase recycling or to reduce non-recyclable um, packaging and products. And I know we can't speak for the entire country, but we can talk about Vermont and how things are going for from what we're seeing. Yeah, and feel free to add to this answer, Beth, but... Um, how much recyclable plastic is actually recycled? So everything, um, every thing that we get in the blue bin that's recyclable is being recycled. So for plastics, um, we uh, we say one, twos, and fives are the recyclable plastics. Um, and if those are making it into the blue bin clean, free of residue, um, so, you know, free of food, then they are being sold out to market and recycled. Um, and I would say there is pressure um, to increase recycling. I think, I think we see pressure from the community, we see pressure from organizations, um, and that's pre that pressure is going towards you know, the government and it's going towards companies producing the plastic in the first place. So um, there's there's a lot going on there. So good question. Exactly. Dave wants to know why the polystyrene recycle label is considered misleading. Good question. So I didn't address that, but that was um, back here. Oops. We'll go back to this slide that you're referring to. So that one's considered misleading um, to many because people see the recyclable or the, re you know, the three arrows, the recyclable symbol is what people call that. Um, it's actually called a resin identification code, and it's not telling you whether or not something's recyclable. It's telling you um, what type of plastic it is. So someone might see that and say, oh, number six, recyclable, I'll, I'll put that in the recycling. Number six is are actually polystyrene, and that um, is a type of plastic that we do not accept um, here in Chittenden County as um, a recyclable item. So it's misleading in that way. Um, a lot of the times people will see that and think it's recyclable, but it's just, a, you know, it could be, you know, number seven. What if you see number seven, that's just other. So that means it could be anything under under the sun, you know, like a compostable type of plastic could have that on it and people might think it's recyclable, but it's not. So a little misleading in that way. Great. Um, and then is there a way, um, this person is it wanted to stay anonymous, but a way to tell greenwashing from a legitimate sustainable company without researching every single company? Mm, good question. So, um, I think the unfortunate answer to that is there isn't like a clear, um, a a clear you know answer to yes this is greenwashing and no this is not greenwashing. I think it does require a little bit of work on the consumer's end to to understand and to research the product. But I think if you use um, sort of the basic tactics that we went over today, um, then that will lead you pretty pretty much into a, a good realm of deciding whether or not something's sustainable. I would urge you to, you know, do research, but if, you know, time and energy doesn't allow for that, um, feel free to, feel free to, you know, email me a question about it. And I, I would be happy to look into it for you. Great. Well, thank you, Kat. 
Yes. Oh, thank wait, you. wait, we have <laughs> one more. Sorry. Chris would like to know if there is any plan by uh, the solid waste districts to get some legislation passed forbidding the use of plastic leftover container straws packaging. It would make a big dent in the trash. Um, much of that is not recyclable, especially the one use um, plastics. Uh, and, and I think you can talk a little bit, Kat, about what you see when you're out in the community at events and, and whatnot. Yeah, that's actually, that's exactly what popped into my mind when I heard this question. I think that um, a lot of, a lot of the pressure that we're putting on, we as CSWD are putting on um, people are, is maybe not so much pressure as just support for um, opting for reusable products, helping to provide events with resources and grants to uh, cut back on single use products. So recently um, we provided a grant to the South End Get Down to uh, buy their own reusable cups instead of using single use cups for the entire um, summer event series that they were running. Um, and then I'm working currently with the Burlington Farmers Market to help them provide sort of a, a foodware purchasing guide for their vendors to make sure that these vendors know what might be a more sustainable product versus something that's not as environmentally friendly. So I think through those resources and conversations where a lot is happening and a lot is happening at, at every scale, whether that's legislative, whether that's sort of grassroots. Um, um, and yeah, so a lot, a lot's happening. And I think Vermont has a lot to look forward to in, in the progress there. Exactly. And one final question. Um, on Amazon, there are they have a climate-friendly pledge. Does that mean anything? Do you know? Hmm, I don't specifically know. Of, I hadn't seen that. So that was... <laughs> yeah, I, I've never heard of a climate-friendly pledge. Um, I do know that Amazon, you know, that their general uh, business practice is uh, fairly um, unsustainable as as a business and um, just with the mass amount of of shipping and consumerism that it promotes. But I think that they are doing things to uh, sort of bridge that, bridge the gap between what they're doing now and towards a more sustainable um, way of doing things, but I would have to look into the climate friendly pledge um, and I'll actually get back to you on that and maybe I'll send a, a little note about that in our follow up email to everyone. Perfect. That's it. Great. Well, thank you everyone for attending and um, before or as you all log off, I'll just quickly say that uh, we have really been enjoying this series and um we have another webinar coming up next month um so same thing first wednesday of the month it will be on recycling special materials and uh my lovely coworker rhonda recycle rhonda as many know her by will be hosting that so that'll be wednesday february 7th at 6 p.m so mark your calendars um You'll learn about, you know, recycling special materials like batteries, plastic bags, mattresses. Um, and she's actually going to go into how you can recycle those things, not in your blue bin, um, but through other means. And then um, you'll get to sort of learn about what that gets turned into, which is really interesting. Uh, I have learned a lot about that in my time working here. So I'll send a registration link um, to that webinar in February. Um, so I'll send that in the follow-up email. Um, and again, thank you all for coming and we look forward to seeing you hopefully next month.